Life's got problems, let's find solutions. This video is on dimensional analysis. This is the first part, just going to show you what it is and how it works. But there's some prerequisites that you have to know before this is really going to make good sense to you. The first one I want to go over is that all numbers have a denominator. When I write the number 3, for example, even though I'm not necessarily showing it, it does have a denominator. It's just the denominator is an understood one. All numbers, whether they are just regular numbers or actual measurements, have a denominator. That's the first thing you got to get under wraps. Next, the reason why I have to bring that up is because when we divide by something, if we use dimensional analysis, what we're actually going to do often is multiply by its inverse. So you got to be comfortable with that idea first. For example, let's say I take 3 and I'm dividing it by 5. 3 fifths. 3 divided by 5 mathematically is the same thing as 3 multiplied by the inverse of 5. Now 5's inverse is 1 fifth. To find the inverse of something, that just means that you switch places the numerator and the denominator. So you've got to be comfortable with the idea that 5 actually does have a denominator of 1, and when we multiply by the inverse, we've switched that. In fact, I can also show 3's denominator right here as being a 1. So 3 divided by 5 is the same thing as 3 over 1 multiplied by 1 over 5. That's going to make sense hopefully a little bit later on. So are you comfortable with that? All numbers have a denominator. Sometimes, quite often, it's just an understood 1. And if you divide by something, that's the same thing as multiplying by its inverse. As long as you're comfortable with that, you're ready to learn some things about dimensional analysis. The way dimensional analysis works is that units are treated just like variables in algebra. If I take 3x and let's say I multiply that by 2x, your math skills hopefully are sharp enough already to where you know that that's going to be 6x times x or x squared. Well, units work the same way as well. If I have something that's 3 centimeters in length, and it's 2 centimeters in width, that equals out to be 6 centimeters squared. And centimeters squared is an area rather than just being some other value of length. This is an actual area, square centimeters. Well, not only can units be multiplied together, they can also be canceled out the same way that we might cancel out algebraic variables. If, for example, I have my 6 centimeters squared, and I divide that by 2 centimeters. You can see I'll already get back to my 3. 6 divided by 2 is equal to 3. But also, my centimeters squared really means centimeters times centimeters. And I'm dividing by a centimeters. So that means I'm going to have 1 centimeter unit left in my numerator. So my centimeters cancel and my squared cancels, I'm left with just centimeters. So I wind up with 3 centimeters. Are you with me so far? Let's show you a really simple problem where dimensional analysis can be used. Let's say somebody is running, Jebediah is running 5 meters per second, and he goes for 20 seconds at that speed. Now some of you might intrinsically know if you want to find out how far he goes, you're just going to take 5 and multiply it by 20. And that's the way we used to do it in just our simple math story problems. With dimensional analysis, we're going to show you some simple ways of using it. And yes, you could not use dimensional analysis and still get to a correct answer. But we teach you these simple problems first, so that way you get the hang of how dimensional analysis works. That way, when AP Chemistry or other college chemistry courses give you more complex problems, you can use this dimensional analysis skill to help solve the problem. I might know to multiply these two together to get how many meters Jebediah actually ran. With dimensional analysis, we might want to write, though, the 5 meters per second is 5 meters for every one second. That's his speed. That's how far or how fast he was going. And if he goes for 20 seconds, we're going to multiply it by 20 seconds. And there's an understood one here at the bottom. Now, if you're looking closely, you might then see that seconds is on the numerator position in this part of the problem, and seconds is in the denominator position at this part of the problem. These seconds then are going to cancel. Not the numbers with them. The numbers still are going to be part of this problem. But seconds divided by seconds will cancel out. I'm going to be left then with just meters as my only unit left in the problem. And that's how I know then my answer is going to be in meters. 
So this winds up being 5 times 20. Jebediah went 100 meters. Now dimensional analysis is quite often used when we do conversions. Let's say we wanted to convert something like from gallons to, oh, let's say, liters. We need to know what the conversion factor is. One gallon is equal to 3.78, let's go all the way to 3.785 liters. And so if we had a conversion of, let's say we measured out and we found 2.5 gallons, how many liters is that going to be? Dimensional analysis can help us make sure to set up this problem correctly. This is our conversion factor, and so we're going to use that by multiplying a ratio of these two numbers. These two things are equal, so if I multiply by a ratio that contains those two measured values, if I multiply by that, then I'm not really changing my value of 2.5 gallons. It's going to be the same volume. I'm just going to be able to express it in different units. If I use dimensional analysis, I'll know where do I put the 1 gallon and where do I put the 3.785 liters? Where do I put those two values? Rather than having to memorize, oh, when you're converting, you always multiply by this number or you divide by that number, you can use dimensional analysis to instruct you on how to set up your problem. Since I want gallons to cancel when this problem's done, I'm going to know to put gallons down here at the bottom. Liters, then, is what I want my answer to be in. I want to know how many liters 2.5 gallons is. So I'm going to put liters at the top. Now that I've got my units in place, I can then put the numbers with them. 3.785 goes here next to the liters. The numbers never change which units they're with from the conversion factor when you put them in the problem. My 1 goes with gallons. 1 gallon is equal to 3.785 liters. And then I'm going to multiply it. Before I even calculate the answer and write it down, we need to have a little talk about significant figures. If you watched my previous videos on significant figures, then hopefully you're up to date with this conversation. Or if you just stumbled upon this video and you're in a class where they don't pay attention to significant figures, I guess you can kind of ignore this part. But for those of you who do deal with significant figures, we need to discuss when is, an, when is a significant figure infinite? When does a value have infinite sig figs? This 2.5 gallons, I don't know what we're measuring here, but it's something that was measured. I don't really know if it's exactly 2.5 with infinite zeros afterwards. Instead, this could be really 2.53 or it could have been 2.49 and it got rounded up to 2.5. So this is measured and it does have significant figures of just two. There's only two sig figs here. But with this conversion factor, if we just blindly follow the sig fig rules we've gotten used to, we might want to think, oh, this one has just one sig fig, and so our answer needs to have one sig fig with our multiplication division rules. That's not true, though. This one actually has infinite sig figs. This one is a definition as far as we are defining one gallon in this problem, it's equal to a certain amount of liters, but we're saying exactly one gallon is equal to this many liters. This number here, 3.785, this actually is also a measured value. This one is just an idea, one gallon, the concept of a gallon. But this 3.785, this is a measured out value of how many liters add up to exactly one gallon. In truth, that number's not 100% accurate. One gallon is more precisely measured out to be 3.78541 liters. But let's say we're doing a problem where we're only given this much information and we are only told that it's 3.785 liters. Well, that 3.785 then is measured and it does have significant figures. In this case, one, two, three, four sig figs. The one, though, is infinite. So when we get to our final answer, we're going to use our multiplication division rules to have just two sig figs in our answer. We're limited by the least number of sig figs of all the measured values in our problem. That one is infinite, so we don't count that, but this 2.5 definitely will help us determine it. So we're going to say 2.5, and we're going to multiply that by 3.785 to get our raw answer, 9.4625. I'm go ahead and write down the raw answer, 9.4625. And then when we round that to the correct number of significant figures, that's going to be just two sig figs. So we're going to call that 9 point, well that 4 rounds up because of the 6. So 
So this is going to be 9.5 gallons canceled, and so this is just liters. There's other cases, too, where numbers might have infinite significant figures. For example, when you're counting something. If I wanted to say that I have three puppies, my units are puppies, and I got three of them, I know that number exactly. It's not like there was any measuring error there. I counted three puppies, there were three puppies. You can't have two and a half puppies. That's gross. So you've got one, or you've got two, or you've got three. When it comes to chemistry, you encounter this often too when you're counting like numbers of atoms or number of electrons. You can't have three and a half electrons. You got one, you got two, you got three. You don't have half electrons. So if I had a, a value of three puppies, yep, I measured it, I counted that there was three, but that's an exact known number, so that would have infinite sig figs. If we define something exactly, then it'll have infinite sig figs. For example, you might know that 1,000 meters is exactly one kilometer. There's no measuring error there because both of these ideas we invented. We invented the idea of meters and we invented the idea of kilometers and we also invented them so that way they would be exactly equal to these values compared to each other. Something like gallons and liters, yeah humans invented that too, but we invented the gallon separately than when we invented the liter. And when we actually try to convert from one to the other we have to check and see measuring how much does one equal of the other. Whereas with meters and kilometers, since they're in the same SI unit systems, the same metric system, then these are exact values. Let's try another one, see how you do with it.